Why do we sometimes put bread in meat? And if we do, how much should we put in there? Well, that last part is easy. The answer is your mixture should be approximately one quarter breadcrumbs by volume. That is, assuming your tastes are somewhat similar to mine, and assuming you're using the kind of breadcrumbs I'm using. I'm using panko. I use panko for pretty much everything these days. Anyway, one quarter of the mixture by volume should be panko, or about 15% by weight, with the panko being measured dry in either case. That is my personal conclusion based upon my experiments, but I'm going to show you what zero breadcrumbs looks like, and I'm going to show you what half breadcrumbs looks like, and everything in between. We'll also try some other kinds of crumbs, and we'll try soaking the crumbs, which a lot of recipes tell you to do. But why put bread into a ground meat product to begin with? Well, the most obvious reason is that grain is much cheaper and more abundant than meat. That's true now, but it was way more true back in the day, pre-modern times. This is an Amish farm we're flying over, pre-modern farming. In between the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution, most people mostly ate grain most of the time. And I suspect one of the reasons we have so many different ways of preparing grain is that People were just trying to break the monotony of eating grain day after day. So sometimes you boil it into a porridge, and sometimes you bake it into bread, and sometimes a cake, and on the occasion that you have a tough old sheep or something that's outlived its usefulness, you might slaughter it, and then you'd grind the meat into tiny little bits because it's so old and tough. Can you read that that says hi? Maybe if I get a little more shadow on it. Meh, that's not going to be the thumbnail. Anyway, you've chopped up your old sheep into bits and the entire village rejoices because meat is good and it's not grain. But you can make that one little sheep feed a lot more people. You can stretch that meat if you mix some grain into it. And that's where you get a classic dish like haggis in Scotland. Little bits of meat mixed with oats and flavorings and cooked in the sheep's bladder or some other casing. Oats are what they had up in Scotland. Down in England, they had wheat, which has gluten, so it's better for making bread. But real bread goes stale and hard really fast, so one thing that you can do is grind it up into crumbs and use it as a cheap filler for meat. Genius. But of course, breadcrumbs also affect the texture and the taste of the meatloaf or meatballs or whatever you're making. And I'm going to show you how approximately 15% dry breadcrumbs by weight gets you a meatloaf as soft and sumptuous as my mattress from Helix Sleep, sponsor of this video. Helix makes premium mattresses customized for your body and your sleep style, shipped right to your door in a box. It's a pretty incredible magic trick. There's a king-size spring and foam mattress in here. It's just under compression. Drag it into your bedroom and break the seal. Foom! I've had my Helix Dusk for over two years, and it's still the perfect blend of cush and support for us. Start by taking Helix's sleep quiz. Tell them your size and shape, tell them how you sleep, etc., and they'll recommend a model. All fiberglass free, it ships right to your door, free in the US. You get a 100 night sleep trial to make sure it fits you, you get a 10 year warranty, and there's financing and payment plans available. Their Labor Day sale is still running. Go to helixsleep.com slash Ragusia to get 25% off your Helix mattress, plus two free pillows. That's a limited time offer, 25% off when you snap my QR code or go to helixsleep.com slash Ragusia right now. Thank you, Helix. Anyway, who wants to make 18 slightly different meatloafs? Meatloaves? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm being told it's meat's loaf. Anyway, today is definitely a food processor kind of day. I've got a pound of carrots, a pound of celery, and two big onions. I'll mix a little olive oil and salt in that pile. I do think meatloaf comes out better if you pre-cook the vegetables at least a little, and for a huge quantity like this, it's probably more convenient to just roast that tray in the oven for a while. My meatloaf glaze is just equal parts ketchup and Worcestershire sauce, with maybe a little mustard mixed in, real good. Over here, I've got six pounds pounds of ground beef cleaned out my chest freezer in the basement. And for each pound, I've got one egg for moisture and binding. I found this seasoning blend in my drawer. It's like garlic powder and pepper and some herbs, basically. Perfect. And some salt. I like to mix a little of my glaze into the meat itself, but that's just my little secret. I'll mix in all those pre-softened vegetables. For meatballs, I don't like to mix this too much. I like to leave it a little bit heterogeneous, because I usually want meatballs to crumble a little as I eat them. For meatloaf, 
I like to mix until homogenous because I want a really solid, clean slice. I want no crumbling. It's really hard for me to eyeball seasoning quantities at this scale, so I'll grab a little ball, microwave it until it's cooked, and then I can safely taste. Yummy. Needs a little bit more seasoning. Mix that up smooth and we are done. Each of my meat's loaf will be exactly one U.S. cup in volume, so they'll all have the same dimensions and they'll cook in the same time. Meatloaf 1 has no breadcrumbs at all in it, done. For meatloaf 2, I'll measure out a tablespoon of my panko, stir that through a cup of meat, repack and remeasure, and that's meatloaf 2. I'll repeat with two tablespoons of panko, and then three tablespoons, and so on. Now you can see my mixed volume is getting significantly greater than one cup, so to keep the loaves all the same volume and dimensions, I need to start scraping off the excess. These are all one U.S. cup. We're going to go all the way to 16 tablespoons of panko. 16 tablespoons is one cup, so this is equal parts breadcrumbs and other stuff by volume. And at this point, the mixture is very stiff. The more breadcrumbs you use, the stiffer the stiffer the mixture is and the more it will hold its shape if you care. Here's one interesting finding already. The raw weights of the no bread loaf and the half bread loaf are almost exactly the same. They both weigh about 220 grams. That's surprising considering that dry bread weighs a whole lot less than meat. My guess about what's going on here is just that I mixed those breadcrumbs through that meat mixture that had some extra meat in it, right? And then that allowed the breadcrumbs an opportunity to absorb some moisture to the point where they weighed about the same as the meat that's around them. I'll coat each of these with my glaze. I gotta say, this is a pretty good way to make individual meat loaves for a party. Oh, I'm sorry, individual meats loaf. I'll roast these at 400 Fahrenheit, 200 C, and today I'll do what the government tells you to do, which is to cook these to 160 Fahrenheit internal, 71 C. Rest thoroughly, just like any other roast. Here's no bread, and here's half bread. You can see how the bread causes the loaf to maintain its shape during cooking. Could be useful if you're doing some kind of novelty shape. Whoa, no bread lost about a third of its weight in the cooking, whereas half bread lost exactly none of its weight. It's literally the same exact weight post-cooking. And if you look back at the pan, you can see why. No bread leaked fat and juice out into the pan, whereas half bread soaked all that goodness up. Bread is absorbent. Another great reason historically to put bread into your meat. In a world where calories are scarce, the bread soaks up all the grease before it can drip down onto the fire and be lost. All right, let's slice through no bread, and the first thing I notice is that it's much softer and squishier in texture. It tastes like a burger with vegetables in it, pretty crumbly. Slice through half bread, and you can see that it is very solid. It tastes bready, verging on like dumpling territory, but it is not dry. It just doesn't taste as meaty as I would want it to taste, so the happy medium must be over in here, right? Here's one 30-second bread, one tablespoon, two tablespoons, three, etc. And one thing you noticed is that you get cleaner, smoother slices the more bread you use. Here's six tablespoons, and this is where things get to tasting really good to me. Seven, very good. Yeah, one quarter panko by volume, or about 15% by weight. That's about perfect for me, or maybe a little bit less. For meatloaf, at least. It's solid, it's smooth, it's retained a lot of its juices, but it still feels and tastes basically like meat. And as you go up all the way to like 16 tablespoons, half bread by volume, oh, the loaf just starts to get an almost pasty textural quality, just too solid and the flavor is overwhelmingly bready. Still decent food, but not what I want in a meatloaf. Let's stick with one quarter panko by volume. But what happens if we use a different kind of breadcrumb, like these Italian breadcrumbs? These are much finer, so they're gonna be denser. Six tablespoons of these is worth like nine tablespoons of the panko, weight-wise. And the result is too bready. But if you measure by weight and your breadcrumbs are dry, 15% by weight should get you a pretty consistent result, regardless of crumb type. Lots of old recipes in particular tell you to soak your breadcrumbs in water or milk. We'll try that twice, because some recipes tell you to squeeze the milk out after the bread has soaked. We'll squeeze one batch and the other we will mix unsqueezed. Now these are both very soft, too soft for my taste, kind of squishy, not super appetizing, and the batch we didn't squeeze out is even worse. I think the soak the bread tradition would have been really useful if you were dealing with a big solid loaf of bread that had gone fully stale. It would have been easier to break that up into little bits if you soaked it first, right? Then you could just mash it up. 
Also, soaking the bread would allow you to use 50% bread or higher and still get a reasonably soft product. Very useful for the days when you needed to feed a lot of people with a tiny amount of meat. But for the times we live in, I say use dry breadcrumbs, about 15% of the mixture by weight, and that is my perfect meatloaf. You figure out what your perfect meatloaf is.